All right, panelists, we are now live on Zoom and on Facebook, and you can switch your cameras on. Hey, everyone. Hello to folks at home. I can see people are joining us um, on the Zoom event live. Um, we are both live on Zoom and on Facebook. Uh, good afternoon or good evening, depending on uh, where you are. Big welcome to our panelists. Um, a big welcome to uh, all of you for just for tuning in. Thank you. This event is called Militarizing the Sky, Opposing Canada's Armed Drone Purchase. And today we're joined by Samar Abdelnur, academic and activist. Maya Garfinkel from World Beyond War, Aziza Kanji, legal academic and writer, Kathy Kelly, who's a longtime peace activist and co-founder of Ban Killer Drones, as well as the board president of World Beyond War, uh, and Tim McSorley from the International Civil Liberties Monitoring Group. Uh, welcome, welcome. So I'm Bianca Majeni. I'm going to be moderating today's uh, webinar, and I'm with the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute. Uh, we're the host and the co-organizers of today's event. Um, and uh, we are also uh, co-hosting and co-organizing uh, today's event with uh, Just Peace Advocates and World Beyond War. Um, so I'm coming to you from Montreal, which is situated on the traditional territory of the Ganyangahaga people and the keepers of the Eastern door of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And uh, we're looking very forward to hearing from folks at home. The chat's open. Please keep your comments civil, cordial, uh, free from racist, sexist, uh, or otherwise harmful commentary, as always. Um, I can already see lots of co comments in the chat. Um, hi, Greg. Uh, hello, Karen. Um, so after our speakers give their initial remarks, we'll be opening up to questions from the audience. So please do post your questions in the, in the Q&A box. It's a lot easier for us to find them there than it is um, in the general chat. Uh, so again, I'm with the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, which is an organization that challenges unjust uh, foreign policy measures and aims to bridge the gap between the perception and reality of Canada's role in the world. Um, and like I said earlier, the event is co-presented by World Beyond War and Just Peace Advocates. World Beyond War is a global nonviolent movement to end war and establish a just and sustainable peace. And you can find out more about this incredible organization at worldbeyondwar.org. Uh, just Peace Advocates is a Canadian-based independent human rights organization that promotes a just peace through the rule of law and respect for human rights in Canada and around the world for the Palestinian people. Um, you can find out more about this terrific organization and its impactful work at justpeaceadvocates.ca. And also uh, Karen Rodman, Just Peace Advocate um, Executive Directors could be helping in the background. Um, so you'll be seeing lots of messages from her. Um, she'll be posting lots of useful links and resources, which we will also be sending to all registrants. So you'll be getting all of those resources in your inboxes. Um, yeah, and you can direct any questions you have to her uh, in the chat. Um, so today's event, uh, today's event um, surrounds the Canadian military's current moves to pick a contender for $5 million worth of armed drones. And this is a great concern. Um, armed drones are, are dangerous. They threaten lives across the globe um, rather than making the world a safer place. Um, they're used in things like surveillance of targeted populations, extra, extrajudicial uh, executions, and other violations of, uh, of human rights. So this is, um, this is an important event and we're really fortunate to have such a stellar panel joining us to discuss the details, the meaning and the likely impacts of purchasing um, and deploying a fleet of, of armed drones. So um, it's also an important event because it marks the launch of a campaign to oppose uh, the procurement of these armed drones for Canada. So it was with great pleasure um, that I will be introducing Tim McSorley, who's our first speaker, uh, of the afternoon, and he'll be giving us a bit of an overview. Uh, Tim McSorley joined the International Civil, Civil Liberties Monitoring Group as the coalition's national coordinator in November 2016. Previously, he was the coordinator for the Media Co-op, uh, Independent, Independent Media Network, and the Dominion Magazine. He also served as coordinator for Voices, or Voix Coalition, defending the rights to dissent and protecting democratic rights in Canada. Welcome, Tim. Thanks so much for uh, having me here, Bianca, and it's great to be here with such a great group of panelists and on such a 
really important and timely issue as, as opposing uh, Canada's planned purchase of, of armed drones. Well, not just planned, but ongoing efforts to purchase uh, armed drones. Um, so our work at the ICLMG, um, well, maybe just to start, uh, today I'm going to try to focus and share a bit of information about where we're at right now with Canada's plan to purchase um, armed drones, some of the timeline and, and the logistics and what we know, which is very vague because uh, as in most cases like this, a lot of the information is kept classified and secret, um, but I'll share a, a little bit of what we know um, to give some context for uh, what the government is looking for and what we uh, think um, it, they will be used, to, uh, these drones will be used for. Uh, first, just a little bit on uh, ICLMG. We're a coalition of 45 groups across Canada that focus primarily on um, anti-terrorism and uh, civil liberties in Canada. And so we don't often look at issues around the national defense that's specifically involved in you know, um, military issues. Um, at the same time, though, uh, on this issue in particular, as in many others, but you know, uh, on drones in particular, it's inextricably linked to the war on terror and the devastating impacts that it's had. Um, just as, as I'm sure you're all aware, just this past weekend marked the 21st anniversary of the attacks of September 11th and also the, the, the start of the lethal and devastating so-called war on terror that's lasted more than two decades. And the use of drone warfare has been a, a key part of that. So that's how our coalition has come to be more involved on this issue. Um, and why we're, you know, looking for ways that we can advocate and, and, and protest the government's um, purchase of these drones and, and, and put an end to this program. Um, as many as of you know, uh, drones have been used by the United States for, uh, for a long time already. Um, and despite all the issues I've come up with how the US has used armed drones, Canada still persists in, in their efforts, um, ignoring the fact that even in 2015, that members of the, the US military, the US's own military denounced the country's use of, of drones, saying, calling it a recruitment tool for um, terrorist organizations has spread more fear and more hatred than it actually brought any safety or security. Um, and so it's uh, really important that we shed light on this and that we push for uh, the Canadian government to abandon its plans. Um, I won't go more into the international context. Uh, we have the, the speakers who are here today are much more knowledgeable of that than I am. And I think we'll, we'll get a, a, a really, a lot of really good insight into um, what the impact of drones and armed drones have been so far. Um, so I'm just gonna share my screen. I, just because a lot of this is a little technical or timelines and information like that. So I thought it'd be better to um, have it up on the screen for you to be able to follow along. Uh, and uh, before I start, I just want to give a, a lot of thanks to the work of other researchers. Um, you know, a lot of this is being that is stuff I pulled together from other researchers, including uh, Matt Corda from the Federation of American Scientists, um, the folks at Project Plowshares, and the research and work that's already being done through the No Armed Drones Network, which is a um, um, Maya is, is uh, coordinating now, and which has really started, you know, organized this event and has really um, gotten the ball rolling on broadening our understanding and, and organizing the opposition to the purchase of armed drones. Um, so you can see that it's been a long process. It started as early as 2005 that the Canadian government has been exploring the purchase of armed drones. Um, and at that time, it was under uh, the original name of the Joint Un, uh, Unmanned Surveillance and Target, uh, Target Acquisition Program. And you'll see that now it, it's been renamed the Remotely Piloted Aircraft System. Uh, so dropping the idea of surveillance and target acquisition from the name and just a much more benign kind of name of being remotely piloted aircraft, uh, which really obscures what these uh, armed drones are and uh, how they'll be used and, and what they're capable of. Um, so over the coming years, the issue would periodically come back up. Um, including uh, during uh, Canada's, um, you know, ongoing uh, occupation and attacks on Afghanistan, uh, and in particular when they leased three armed, uh, three surveillance drones from the Israeli government from 2008 to 2011, or rather three Israeli drones. I'm not sure if they are leased from the government or just Israeli companies, because um, as I think others will discuss, uh, Israeli companies have been at the forefront of developing. Um, drones, in, including drones being, um, I believe, being considered by the Canadian government. Um, and so those were leased, but it wasn't an ongoing program. 
Um, and it would take a few more years, as you can see, until 2017, when the liberal government would actually um, formally announce that they were pursuing uh, armed drones. This isn't because of a, a change in uh, ethics or morality or a vision of the government. Um, in fact, what they've said is that's because they were waiting to see where the technology was going and waiting to see how they could adequately integrate it into Canada's uh, military. Um, and that was the reason for the, the starts and stops a, a, on this project. But it was never something that was, you know, abandoned because they thought it was a bad idea, um, but rather just because they wanted to make sure that they could get, I, I guess, the, the best drones possible, which is also frightening. Um, so in 2017, the Liberals came out with a, a new defense policy called Strong, Secure, Engaged. Um, and it was in that defense policy that they announced that they would be pursuing the purchase of, um, of armed drones. Um, in 2019, uh, the project was granted formal approval, and there were two uh, companies that were identified as the, as the main contenders to provide um, the drones, L3 Technologies and General Atom Atomics uh, Aeronautical Systems, and that second one would actually be in conjunction with the U.S. government um, in order to provide drones. Um, earlier this year, in early 2022, uh, the federal government initially officially launched the competition uh, between those two companies. Uh, and um, by 2024, we believe that the contracts are likely to be awarded uh, and that the first drones, there's some discussion on this, but either late 2025 or in 2026 that the first drones would be delivered and that the final drones would be delivered by 2030 and that at that point they would become operational. Um, of course, this is a lot of speculation and what's being reported in the media. Most of the information has been kept classified, including the uh, formal um, request for proposals that, that's part of this competition. We don't actually have our hands on, on that. Um, and so a lot of this is what the government has been willing to release, but there's also some older information that I'll talk about uh, from 2016 um, that uh, provides a little bit more uh, details on what we, what we can expect. Um, and of course, you know, one of the one of the main problems with any programs like this is that the government does keep it as secret as possible, both for national security reasons and they claim uh, for competitive and to protect the the interests of the companies who are involved in, in the process. Um, so what we know about the logistics of what the government is looking for, uh, you can see here are some of the details that they're looking for medium altitude and long endurance systems that would, uh, so long endurance would essentially to allow them to conduct um, uh, long-term uh, surveillance activities and target acquisition, I mean, you know, uh, aiming and, and targeting uh, individuals um, for, uh, for lethal attacks and assassination. Um, that, the, that they be equipped for intelligence surveillance and renaissance uh, recon reconnaissance. Um, activities, and we'll talk a bit more about that in a little bit. And as I mentioned, that they'd have to be able to carry out precision strikes. Uh, so using, um, uh, from what we know, uh, the suggestion was that they'd be able to be armed with Hellfire missiles and that they and other precision guided munis munitions. Um, that they can operate in congested domestic civil airspace, which is important when we talk about their reconnaissance um, capabilities later on. A 25 year life service. So this uh, shows that it is a long term plan. This isn't simply, you know, looking to lease or, or have them for a few years, but to integrate them as a key part of Canada's military. Um, and also that speaks to the cost that they'll that they'll have to uh, to Canadians during their lifespan, because as you'll as you can see, um, the cost for the purchase is estimated up to five billion dollars. Um, but that doesn't include the maintenance and costs over the 25 year lifespan of the drones. Um, as I mentioned, the current uh, uh, request for proposals has been classified. I know there's individuals have been working to declass to uh, um, request them through access to information requests and, and, and find out more information. But so far, as far as I know, uh, that hasn't come out. Um, some more recent information uh, that we have, the government has now said they, they don't know how many drones they will acquire, and that's part of the process. Um, at some point, it was being re reported that there will maybe be 12 drones acquired, um, but now that seems to be uh, less certain. Um, that it will uh, require um, 250 to 300 staff in the military in order to maintain and, and run uh, the drone program. 
and they have identified where the drones will be based so that they will the, they've announced that they'll be based in Nova Scotia and in British Columbia. Uh, the control center uh, for actually controlling the drones will be based somewhere in the Ottawa area and that there will also be a, a forward operating station located in Yellowknife. Um, so that's some of the logistics. And now um, we can talk a little bit about how the government has said they envision using them. And this really comes from the 2016 letter of interest that the government put out. So as I said, uh, this is the most inf recent information, public information that there is. Um, but they provided fairly detailed scenarios in uh, this letter of interest um, that raised significant concerns around how um, drones, uh, these drones will be used. Um, so they identified uh, um, several areas, including Arctic surveillance, uh, maritime security and surveillance, uh, domestic overland surveillance, expeditionary maritime scenarios. So um, um, loading the drones onto ships in support of NATO operations in, uh, in maritime uh, theaters, as they call them. Uh, expeditionary ISR strike scenario, which is the, the, the use of drones for armed lethal strikes and training scenarios for the um, Royal Canadian Air Force. Um, I'm, I'm going to go into a bit more detail on the domestic overland surveillance and the expeditionary um, strike scenarios. But just to mention the others, I won't go into as much detail, but they're not benign. Um, so for example, Arctic security surveillance, um, it's, it's around protecting Canadian sovereignty, uh, and, you know, framed as protecting the Northwest West Passage from, I guess, from Russian incursion and, and other foreign incursion. But of course, um, running um, surveillance over the Arctic would also uh, be in, would, would allow them to surveil um, uh, indigenous communities and Inuit in, in communities in the North and, and others as well. Um, so it isn't simply a, a matter of, you know, protecting us from these evil enemies, uh, which in itself is a concerning scenario, um, but also um, for exerting, you know, the, the colonial ideas of Canadian sovereignty on those territories. Um, the maritime security and surveillance is also framed as protecting, um, as, as fighting against smugglers, but also protecting against terrorists who might be approaching Canada by boat. Um, I'm not sure we've ever seen this uh, scenario play out, but apparently it's something that is of great enough concern to the military to include in their letter of proposal. I, I think it's just, you know, another example of the exaggerations that they use in order to justify the, the purchase of these weapons. Um, and of course, the expeditionary maritime scenarios, we know that, for example, Canada claimed that it was not involved in the, the war on Iraq following uh, the attacks of September 11th, um, but that uh, it did provide, you know, logistical and naval support. Um, and so the idea that, we, that these um, drones could be loaded onto boats and provide some kind of support um, you know, shows another way in which it, they, they could be used for um, uh, military and, and problematic ways. So to get into the, the two other specific scenarios that um, I want to describe in a, in a bit more detail. Um, oh, just give me one second. Um, so the domestic overland surveillance example that they gave is really quite extraordinary and actually one that I think a lot of people can relate to. Um, and they lay out a scenario where there's a G20 summit happening in Canada um, and that the military is enlisted to support RCMP security operations. So that's something that's important to bear in mind is that the military isn't you know, relegated simply to um, military affairs, but they can be called in to support uh, law enforcement in different scenarios. Um, they would be involved in surveillance of the crowd and to record data, so uh, engaging in surveillance. Back in 2016, we weren't talking about facial recognition technology as much, but we definitely are now. And so it wouldn't be far-fetched to see that kind of technology equipped on these, on these drones. Uh, and that they would be reporting back to the RCMP in order to single out anti-capitalist radical elements in the crowd that are in need of control. So we know this already happens on the ground and this isn't something new, but is something that uh, continues, um, but would be aided by the drones. Um, and that, in fact, that they would, uh, that, the, that the successful scenario involved intercepting a planned global warming banner drop. So not even something that was involved in a, in a violent confrontation, something that would even, you know, be questionably considered illegal, but is simply as, as you know, you know, effective, but, um, you know, 
we would say maybe not not threatening to people or or or, or individuals as a banner drop, but this is what they envision stopping. Uh, I think I'm running out of time, so I won't go into much more here, but we know about the use of, of drones and law enforcement in the US already. And just to talk about the expeditionary strikes, um, you know, it, it's a wordy way of saying carrying out lethal um, targeted strikes in, in other countries. Uh, and the example they give, of course, is that would be supporting Canadian operations in Afghanistan, um, that it would provide early warnings of visible threats. Uh, and, uh, you know, of course, uh, uh, the most concerning is this idea that it would be able to identify um, uh, enemy combatants again, using the same vague wording that the U.S. has used of fighting aged males. So essentially any uh, military aged males over 16 who are found in a strike zone. And that's been not, in fact, you know, even though we know that uh, tens of thousands of civilians have been killed by drone strikes, that also serves to obscure the idea that, um, you know, that, that, uh, men over the age of 16 are civilians and not simply military targets. Um, and that they would use these, uh, and that it would be used to carry out so-called targeted strikes, which we know, and I'm sure, and I know other people will be discussing are not targeted uh, at all and, and lead to uh, much broader death and destruction. Um, you know, this came out in 2016 when Canada was more directly engaged in military operations in Afghanistan. Uh, but we can also envision that with the um, establishment of the Taliban government in Afghanistan, that if more conflict erupts, uh, develops, that, that Canada could, again, uh, we could foresee more greater military involvement in Afghanistan. Or, of course, Canada's involved in multiple other so-called conflict zones around the world where um, uh, these drones could be deployed in the same way. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing the, the, the other speakers. And, and again, thanks, Bianca, and um, to all the organizers for, for putting this together today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, what an incredible, clear presentation. Um, it's great to have this overview to start. I um, hope you can all hear me. There's a lot of construction outside of my window. Um, but it's great to have this overview um, and to just know the, the sort of the basic logistics of the drone procurement program. Um, and what we know so far about how these systems might be used. Um, it's concerning, you know, terrifying even to hear all this intel, um, but I'm grateful for the amazing research that's gone into this and, uh, you know, just the work that's gone into, you know, accessing this information. Also, Tim, uh, very, very grateful for the work of uh, ICLMG and uh, would encourage people to find out more about uh, your work at ICLMG.ca. Um, it's great to see the turnout today. It's a sunny afternoon, at least here in Montreal, and there's about 109 of us on the call, which is great. Uh, really good to see this level of engagement around the topic, as important as this. Um, I also just want to draw people's attention to the fact that there is a, an opportunity to send a message to Canadian Minister of Defence, uh, Anita Anand. Um, Karen will be posting that in the chat, but we basically have a letter, ac a letter action um, where you can uh, send a message basically um, through, through this tool. So do check that out. Um, our next panelist of uh, the afternoon is Aziza Kanji. Um, Aziza is a legal academic and writer. She rece received her Juris Doctor from the University of Toronto's Faculty of Law and Masters of Law specializing in Islamic Law from the Toronto School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. Aziza's work focuses on issues relating to racism, law, and social justice. Her writing has appeared regularly in Canadian and international media, including Al Jazeera English, the Toronto Star, the National Post, the Ottawa Citizen, Truth Out, and the Jacobin. Aziza also serves as the Director of Programming at the Noor Cultural Centre. Welcome, Aziza. Bianca, I think Aziz's um, oh, internet is just cut out, she said. So we may need to go to the next person. I'm back. Internet crisis resolved. Welcome. Hi. Sorry, did you did you introduce me? I did. Let, if you're having some troubles, let me know and we could we could go to the next speaker and come back to you. Would you prefer that? Oh no, I think I think it's it's fine now. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Bianca, 
Uh, salam, greetings of peace and justice, everyone. I am speaking to you from the lands of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Mississaugas, and the Huron-Wendat peoples, who, like Indigenous nations across this land that currently calls itself Canada, continue to be subjected to colonial genocidal dispossession, domination, and denial of their lands, their legal orders, and their sovereignty. At rallies and at protests, we commonly recite this chant from Turtle Island to Palestine, occupation, colonialism is a crime, but it is more than simply just a crime. It is in fact an ongoing crime, a continuous crime that requires a continuous infusion of violence in order to sustain itself. Violence that is increasingly enacted and affected with drones. The scopic violence, of making Indigenous peoples have to be seen and surveilled while the operations of power of the government hide themselves behind operations of secrecy so that they themselves cannot be seen and surveilled in return. The psychological violence of Indigenous peoples and other colonized peoples and people subject to drones know that they are subject to a dominating overwhelming power. Thing is, is it just me or has Aziza gone frozen? All right, I'll just give it uh, a couple more seconds, and if we don't hear from Aziza, then we'll just move on to the next speaker, and we'll 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 get Aziza back when uh, the internet is a little bit better. All right, it's been a couple seconds. All right, so we're going to move on to our next panelist of uh, the evening. Um, uh, Summer Abdelnour is a Palestinian Canadian academic and activist. He's an associate professor in strategic management at the University of Edinburgh. Prior to this, he held positions at the University College London and at the Rotterdam School of Management. In 2009, Summer co founded Al Shabaka, a transnational Palestinian think tank whose mission is to foster public debate on Palestinian human rights. Welcome, Summer. Thank you, uh, Bianca, and uh, thank you, Karen, for having me. Um, and uh, Aziza, I see that you've you've popped back on, but uh, given some of the tech issues, I'm just going to go forward uh, if that's all right. So um, uh, I'm really delighted uh, to be here and to speak uh, along these, um, you know, really thoughtful and, and active colleagues. Uh, on this important issue. My uh, part of the talk will draw from a forthcoming essay titled, Making a Killing, Israel's Military Innovation Ecosystem and the Globalization of Violence, which I will hopefully be able to share um, through networks in uh, the coming weeks. I think it's important for us to focus on Israel now because of its leadership in developing drone technology and the likelihood that Israeli weapons companies like Elbit will be vying for the tender. Um, on the 2nd of October, 2018, journalist Jamal Khashoggi visited the Saudi consulate in Istanbul on the pretext of receiving papers for his wedding. We all know this was a setup. Upon entering the consulate, Saudi assassins strangled Khashoggi then dismembered and dissolved his body in acid. Soon after, it was found that the mobile phones of his wife and close friend were targeted using Pegasus, a military-grade spyware developed by Israeli cyber weapons company NSO Group, and that this likely facilitated the assassination. And this was not an isolated incident. Numerous investigations, including those by University of Toronto Citizen Lab and investigations by global media outlets, show that dozens of governments and intelligence agencies use Pegasus spyware as a weapon to monitor tens of thousands of activists, journalists, and politicians globally. So why is Pegasus important? Why am I raising it? Well, I'll argue that military technologies like Pegasus are developed within military innovation ecosystems and in context of extreme violence and that enacting violence, including crimes against humanity, is absolutely essential for their development and also for their global proliferation through arms sales. And this is uh, also um, um, quite relevant to drones and drone technology. 
So I use the term military innovation ecosystem rather than military industrial complex to refer to the constellation of industries, infrastructures, and organizations involved in weapons development, testing and sales, uh, military and state agencies, tech startups, private companies, universities, research institutes, banks, and also venture financing. And they also enroll actors not conventionally thought of as being involved in weapons development, such as public research funding agencies via dual use technologies that have both civil and military application and drones is one of them. And increasingly, we're seeing um, countries and also the EU looking to uh, put more investment in um, such technologies, which they call dual use, such as drones, because they see them as having um, both military and civil application and something that um, can, uh, they, they're seeing it as a new market and uh, as an area for market growth and economic growth. So in the case of Israel, which is widely celebrated as a startup nation, the development and monetization of military technologies like drones is deeply tied to the violence it enacts upon a captive, subjugated native population, the Palestinians. And in my view, there are three factors that give Israel's military innovation ecosystem a unique capacity to both develop and sell weapons technology. First, Israel receives an unprecedented a number of subsidies in the form of US military aid, almost 4 billion US dollars annually, and totaling over 250 billion in current US dollars since Israel's founding. This is coupled with political protection that gives Israel complete impunity for crimes against humanity and carte blanche opportunities to innovate and monetize violence. Second, mandatory military conscription for the majority of Israeli citizens has militarized wide swaths of Israeli society, blurring lines between Israel's military and other sectors. So for instance, it's well known that military officers serving in Israel's elite cyber surveillance unit often end up working for weapons companies and startups like Pegasus or like Elbit, which is a, a leading producer of drone technologies. Another example is close collaboration amongst Israeli's military police forces and settlers living on Illegal, um, illegally occupied Palestinian and Syrian territory. Third, Israel's regime of apartheid and military occupation subjects 6 million Palestinians to extreme levels of surveillance and violence. And this acts as a laboratory for developing, experimenting with, and testing weapons that Israel can then sell to the global arms market as field tested. And this frightening phenomenon is captured in Yotam Feldman's film, The Lab, and in a forthcoming book by Anthony Lowenstein called The Palestinian Laboratory. And taken together, these factors have engineered large parts of Israel, Israel's economy towards the production and maintenance and violence. And even, um, even in the 80s, it was widely reported that one in 10 Israeli citizens were working in military industries. And that number has likely grown given the uh, tremendous growth of Israel's weapons, um, weapons um, and arms industry. So of course, Israel is not the only example of how organized violence inflicted upon colonized subjugated peoples fuels the development, experimentation and globalization of tech for control, surveillance and violence. So, we know that British violence in Ireland, including in the plantations and engineered famine, influenced patterns of British colonial violence across Africa, Asia, and the Americas. Germany's genocide of the Herero, Nama, and Sans peoples in Africa enabled it to develop techniques of violence such as concentration camps and mass starvation that were later used and advanced at scale in the Holocaust. And Afrikaners who established apartheid in South Africa learned from Canada's subjugation of First Nations peoples, just as Israel looked to South Africa's apartheid system as a model for the Bantustanization of Palestinian people, lands, and resources. And the links between Israel's violent subjugation of Palestinians and its arms trade stretch back to before its establishment as a state in 1948, but it began to grow after 1967 with expanded military occupation of Palestinian Sir Syrian territories, when Israel's weapons companies, then mostly state-owned, began focusing on technologies relevant for maintaining the military occupation of Palestine and its war with Lebanon. 
And, um, and at that time, it targeted like-minded regimes like apartheid South Africa for sales. And this strategy enabled Israel to emerge by the 1980s as a global arms leader. Um, but Israel's military innovation ecosystem entered a new phase of growth after the 2007 blockade and siege of Gaza, a phase which uh, involves tremendous in violence and surveillance, including uh, routine bombardment of residential areas and civilian infrastructure and destruction of and contamination of agricultural lands and livestock. Much of this violence enacted through drone, uh, armed drones. And since 2007 alone, thousands of Palestinians in Gaza have been killed, tens of thousands maimed, hundreds of thousands displaced. And as a result of this violence, the people of Gaza suffer unthinkable levels of malnutrition, trauma, unemployment, and hardship. And for Israel, the incredible violence it enacts upon Gaza is extremely profitable. So last year, Israel's arms exporters, sorry, arms exports reached an all-time high of 11.2 billion US dollars placing it firmly as a top 10 global arms producer. And in the coming years, further growth is expected via US brokered weapons for peace agreements with regional states like Morocco and Saudi Arabia, and drone technology is a cornerstone of those agreements. So Israel's advancement of drones has been a significant part of its ability to enact horrendous atrocities against Palestinians and globalize this violence through arms sales. And in a recently published article titled Apartheid Drone, Infrastructures of Militarism and the Hidden Genealogies of South, the South African Seeker, Catherine Chandler meticulously details how the drone was advanced by both South Africa and Israel and deeply tied to the maintenance of apartheid and subjugation of people in South Africa and Palestine and also for waging border warfare across Southern Africa and with Lebanon. And so my key point and my closing point is this, Canada's purchase of drones and other arms agreements, and particularly uh, should those be with Israel, should be understood within the historical and contemporary context of how military innovation ecosystems both enact violence and monetize violence. So were Canada to move forward with purchasing Israeli drones, it would effectively reward Israel for decades of military occupation and apartheid, and we should think of it as a direct investment in the ongoing ethnic cleansing and slow genocide of the Palestinian people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Summer, for that uh, presentation. Um, it's important for us to have this, you know, the specific context in this important Israeli uh, case study. It's a lot of very alarming information. Um, you know, thank you for highlighting the links between the arms trade and subjugation. That was very illuminating for me. Um, and of course, it's terrible to hear about the impacts of, of this on the Palestinian people. Um, we look very forward to hearing more from you. In the q and I just want to mention to our audience that um, Karen has been posting some relevant articles. There's also an action that you can take, um, uh, hashtag no Israeli arms for Canada, um, that's also uh, been shared. And I also want to take a minute to remind people um, to write to the defense minister, um, Anita Anand, telling her not to militarize the sky. Um, so we're now going to go back to Aziza. Um, so happy to have you back. Welcome, welcome back, Aziza. Very happy to be back. Thank you, Bianca. Um, Samer just now spoke so powerfully about the place of drones in the Israeli settler colonial capitalist matrix of violence, power, and domination. And so I want to talk a bit more in my part about the role of drones in Canada's settler colonial matrix of domination and what's at stake in the multiple relations of violence that sustain it. Um, when I started previously, I was um, interrupted in the midst of giving uh, thanks to all of those who have made this webinar possible, all of those who have been doing uh, research that is making making our activism on this issue possible, all of you who are here today. Uh, but I also want to give a shout out to uh, Public Works and Government Services Canada for effectively writing my talk for me today. Because in its letter of interest, outlining its specs for drone procurement and the uses to which it intended, intends to put these drones, it provides a damning, chilling document 
of the way that multiple faces of state violence, which we normally think of and act on as separate, how these multiple faces of state violence are actually intimately connected to each other. And so our activism must also correspondingly be connected. As Tim noted in his remarks, the letter of interest outlines several scenarios uh, describing potential situations for which the uh, Canada's armed drones would be used. Scenario one, Arctic surveillance. That is an assertion of Canada's domination, sovereignty, and capacity to surveil colonized indigenous peoples and lands in the North, such that we know that the Inuit, the presence of the Inuit people is only acknowledged by Justin Trudeau as perversely uh, consolidating Canada's settler colonial claim to sovereignty over the North, saying that it is the presence of Inuit people who have been there for millennia that is the ground of Canadian sovereignty, somehow the presence of the colonized uh, formulating the foundation for Canada's settler colonial um, sovereignty premised on the dispossession of those very people in the North. Indeed, we know from Standing Rock to Sepwekmuk to Wet'suwet'en how drones have been used as an enforcer of what um, scholar I.L. Weitzman refers to as the vertical occupation of indigenous space, extending far into the sky to enact surveillance over indigenous peoples in order to uh, ratify the col colonial state's right to extract resources and materials and oil from deep within um, indigenous grounds. Conversely, indigenous people's own use of drones to surveil the state's violence and domination and brutality against them, for example, to film police brutality against land defenders at Standing Rock is not only uh, condemned, but criminalized as an act of violence in and of itself. Scenario two, border enforcement. And in the letter of interest, specifically, it is uh, the specific scenario given is surveillance of quote unquote illegal Tamil, Tamil migrants into Canada uh, who are approaching Canada by boat over the water. I don't know how uh, in this document, the determination preemptively that these migrants are illegal is made and yet illegal migrants is how they are presumptively described. We know from not so distant history how this kind of racial fear mongering against Tamil migrants has been used in the case of the MV Sansi migrants, for instance, to not only subject those Tamils fleeing extreme violence to violence in Canada, the violence of extraordinary um, indefinite detention, including of children, but also to use that situation to further radicalize, to make more harsh and draconian Canada immigration and asylum law in general applied against asylum seekers writ large. And so this is a reminder that when we were talking about surveillance by drones, this surveillance, even when supposedly uh, not accompanied by missile strikes, is part of a much larger, larger complex of violence, domination, and control. In Europe, the use of drones has emerged as a preferred tactic for monitoring the movement and the attempted movement of migrants um, overseas fleeing um, the devastation of war and, and environmental destruction. Drones being preferred because they permit the surveillance of migrants while not incurring the responsibility on human boats to uh, rescue migrants who are drowning at sea. And so drones emerge as a technology for exerting human powers of surveillance and visuality without incurring the responsibility, the human responsibility of rescue, a way of effectively watching migrants die remotely at sea. It is no coincidence, again, that many of these drones are being provided and have been developed by the Israeli state advertised as battle and lab tested on Palestinians under the colonial boot. The violence of drones at borders is a reminder of the inherently violent nature of borders themselves. 
borders which are violent, not only against the migrants who are attempting to cross them and yet are blocked, while the very sources of the violence that they are attempting to flee, the weapons, the mining corporations are permitted to pass these borders, these borders not only violent against migrants, but also against the indigenous peoples whose lands, whose mobilities, whose nations these borders dismember. Scenario three, armed, um, armed surveillance of Somali pirates off the East African coast. In a context in which we know that this piracy as study and study again and again have shown, this piracy is motivated and exacerbated in the first place by the illegal unregulated foreign overfishing of Somali waters, depriving those who become pirates of their livelihood from their seas. And so yet again, as we see with the policing and surveillance of migrants, those who bear the brunt of colonial and capitalist systems of depredation and domination are also made to bear the brunt of the violence of policing these systems of exploitation so that they may be permitted to continue without check. Scenario four, domestic policing of the G20 summit in order to surveil in the words of the letter of interest, quote, radical elements who may exploit the presence of international media to further their anti-capitalist cause by disrupting the summit, including in the scenario given in the letter of interest, simply by hanging a banner proclaiming their opposition to the capitalist depredation of peoples and lands. As the violence of drones is a sign of the inherent violence of borders themselves. The violence of drones in this case is a reminder of the inherent violence of policing in and of itself, which as political theorist Mark Neocles reminds us at its very foundations is premised on the imperative to, put, to protect capitalist property, whether it be the property in, in stolen enslaved black people or the property in stolen indigenous lands and waters. Finally, scenario five, military targeting of quote unquote fighting aged males in Afghanistan who are condemned to death solely on the criteria as described in the letter of interest of holding something that could either be a cell phone or a radio and being located next to a shovel. That is enough to mark them as a target deserving of death. This scenario of death dealing by drone outlined so casually in this letter of interest as if it is a normal legitimate exercise of violence is what in other contexts, if enacted by other actors, for example, those same Afghan men who are on the receiving end of the drone would be called terrorism. So what we see through all these scenarios is how the colonial matrix of power as in the colonial killing fields and torture chambers of decades and centuries past. What it is seeking ultimately is a unilateral license to kill, surveil and torture, to use almost unrestricted violence while being completely immunized from any kind of violence or even nonviolence in return, as is manifest in the disciplining of indigenous land and water defenders defending their own ancestral lands and territories, and in the disciplining of protesters merely attempting to hang a banner in opposition to the, to the capitalist rape of our, of, of, of our communities and our lands. Palestinian legal scholars like Nimar Sultani have helped us to see how all colonial systems of power are sustained by dividing and disconnecting and dissociating things that are intimately connected to each other, peoples and forms of violence. War versus police, inside versus outside, here versus there, citizens versus non-citizens. These are the categories of power and division through which colonial violence sustains itself. And yet in the letter of interest speaking to the uh, Canada's desire in acquiring a drone, the connections of violence enacted across these borders is, in, is, is explicitly revealed. And so inshallah, this movement against 
Canada's acquisition of our armed drone will be an opportunity and an impetus for us to develop movements against violence that are as interconnected as the forms of violence, the forms of state violence, which we currently confront. Thank you everyone for being here. Salam alaikum, greetings of peace. And I look forward to hearing the other panelists and um, all, from all of you during the discussion. Oh, thank you so much, Aziza. Thank you for providing those compelling, if uh, not terrifying examples and for connecting the dots for us with such clarity and with such passion um, and for clarifying just how dangerous uh, these drones are, these armed drones. Um, I think you've really helped certainly me and, and hopefully your audience to connect the you know sort of ongoing drone imperialism to our colonial legacy at home um, and you know making that connection between domestic policing and international warfare as you say uh, they're all connected um, so I look very very forward to hearing more from you in the Q and A um, our next panelist of the afternoon slash evening is Kathy Kelly. Kathy Kelly is a peace activist, a pacifist, an author. She helped found and coordinate the Voices Campaign, which worked for 25 years to end US military and economic warfare. Uh, Kathy is also uh, the board uh, president of World Beyond War. Um, she's a founder of Ban Killer Drones um, and visits to war zones in Gaza, Lebanon, and Afghanistan. Um, Kathy has written eyewitness accounts about the consequences of drone warfare. She served three months in prison in 2015 for attempting to deliver a loaf of bread and a set of questions to the commander uh, of Whiteman AFB, which operated weaponized drones over Afghanistan. Welcome, Kathy. Well, thank you, Bianca. And it's certainly a benefit to hear such chilling and impassioned and crucial information. Um, I'd like to start by sharing my screen and thinking with you a little bit about some artwork with regard to drone warfare. So um, I had practiced this earlier. I hope I can get to it quickly. Um, yes, it's working. Yes. So um, this is a very unusual um, artistic rendition in which um, an Iraqi person who had become a, um, an, an immigrant to the United States, I think I met him in the late 90s, became a, a professor at the Tisch School of Art in New York University, Wapa Bailao. In 2004, his brother Hajj was killed by a, an airborne missile. He was killed by a United States launch of an airborne missile. And so what Wafa Bailal decided to do is ask a tattoo artist to tattoo on his back the name of every city in Iraq, sort of um, spaced out as though it were a map. And then for every name that's being read by the woman at the microphone in the background, a tattooed red dot was placed on his back so he carries on his back the names of the US and the Iraqi people killed by airborne missiles and other attacks over the course of the United States war in Iraq. And this was done in 2010. It was called And Counting. And I, I present that because I'm so challenged by Wafa Bailal's personal awareness of all of the harm that's done by the airborne and other kinds of attacks. And similarly, this young girl, an Afghan young girl, uh, will forever be seen by any drone that flies over the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa area of, of, of Pakistan. She had fled with her family to Pakistan. They were refugees. And somehow people in that compound that was her family's compound were designated as terrorists. And so now she is an orphan. Her parents were killed. Two of her siblings were killed. And a group of artists created this installation, which drone operators would see now. They wouldn't see just a you know, grainy blip. And they called it not a bug splat. Because in military parlance, the people that are killed by drones, they, they appear like a bit of a blob. And so uh, they call them bug splat. And people who run away are called squirters. 
And this is the picture that that art installation was cropped from. She and her siblings are holding shrapnel from the bomb that killed their parents and their siblings. And this is Adil Al-Mantari, a Yemeni man who was with four of his relatives and none of them were in the least bit uh, associated with terrorism. In fact, one of the relatives was in the military. He himself worked for the Yemeni government and uh, he now is uh, coping with tremendous suffering, psychological trauma, uh, bones that have been broken and had to be replaced. And he's, he's to this day not gotten one word of acknowledgement or compensation from the United States government. He's recovering in a hospital in Cairo and, and individuals have contributed money to assist Adel Al-Mantari. So in the United States, we um, tried to pay attention to the, the victims of our terrible drone attacks. And it's not so easy to do. And, and I, I, you know, I want to um, mention to you something that surprised me. It appeared in the New York Review of Books. And I'll just um, show you this so you can see it. I think that's good. But this is an article that is in the September New York Review of Books, which begins with this description of what's called the uh, Ninja Bomb, the flying Jinso. It's an air to surface drone launched missile, appro approximately five feet long and seven inches in diameter, weighing roughly 100 pounds with a top speed of 995 miles per hour. And um, carrying no explosives, this R9X is unique. To avoid collateral damage, it's designed to kill a human being with what is called a kinetic or hit to kill design. In other words, the weapon uses a combination of the force of 100 pounds of dense material flying at high speed and six attached blades, which deploy before impact to crush and slice its victims. Think of a lawnmower. This is the bomb that was used on July 31st to kill Ayman al-Zahi in Kabul. And prior to that killing, there was another which was extremely chilling in, on August 29th, 2021. Uh, a man named Ayman, I'm sorry, a man named um, Zamarai Ahmadi, who worked for a United States NGO was, um, driving errands because he thought he was going to the United States. He had an SIV visa. His bags were packed along with those of his immediate family members. And instead he was misidentified as a terrorist as he was placing canisters of water to deliver to his neighbors. He was misidentified as someone who was putting bomb material in the back of his car. And so as he drove into his own courtyard and the children gathered outside because when dad came home with the car, he'd let one of the older boys park it. And so we've had a Don't Look Away campaign in which we've tried to remember the members of Zamarai Ahmadi's family who were killed on August 29th. Um, Zamarai was age 43. His oldest son, Zamir Ahmadi, age 20. His son, Faisal Ahmadi, age 16. Fazar Ahmadi, age 10. Benjamin, age 6. Arwin, age 7. Samurai's nephews. And three little girls. Hayat, age 2. And the twins, Sumaya and Malika, age 3. So we say to ourselves in the United States and the Van Killer Drones movements and other movements, don't look away. And so um, next week will be a wonderful uh, gathering. It's called Shut Down Creech, and it's an annual gathering that's gone on since 2009. And last year, people gathered with silhouettes of those family members I just mentioned. And then eventually they blocked the road leading up to the Creech Air Force Base in Nevada. And uh, they, they will have a wonderful action forthcoming as well. And we're trying to make sure that at other places where drones are being launched or drone pilots are being trained, there will similarly be actions happening. Um, but we're very inspired by what happens at Creech Air Force Base every year. 
Likewise, we're inspired by Daniel Hale. Daniel Hale so bravely disclosed to Jeremy Scahill writing for The Intercept the information government documents. He was a drone analyst, government documents that showed that 95% of the time over one particular five month span called Operation Haymaker, the drones hit someone other than their so-called intended target. And he wasn't thanked for providing that incredibly needed educational information. He was imprisoned and he has now served a little over a year in the Marion Federal Prison. He has a four year sentence. So many people across the United States will be involved in what we're calling the Merchants of Death War Crimes Tribunal. We want to, in 2023, so there's a lot of time to plan for this, and we invite all of our Canadian friends to please become involved. Um, this is Sally Latch's rendition of a woman holding her, a lifeless body and surrounded by lifeless bodies with the airborne vehicles in the background still dropping the bombs. And so we want to put the Merchants of Death the weapon makers, the drone makers, on trial more or less by holding a tribunal, but the evidence will especially come from those who survive, those who are the victims, those whose lives are forever changed. And this will be in um, November of 2023, beginning November 10th, and then we'll encourage everybody to observe, reclaim Armistice Day on November 11th and continue with the tribunal on the 12th and the 13th. And we certainly welcome Canada's participation in that. Uh, it, we, I want to personally wish each of you all the very, very best as you work to stop Canada from acquiring weaponized drones. Um, these drones are uh, something that doesn't ensure safety for anybody. And the proliferation is something we can count on. We're certainly seeing that today, aren't we? And do we think that the proliferation of those drones isn't going to eventually mean that all of us will be uh, wishing for the sake of the children and the grandchildren that we had stopped this terrible process. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy, for the critical sort of perspective that you provi provided just the sh showcasing the depth of human suffering um, that these drones have brought. And also just for reaching our, our hearts really with a um, powerful medium of art. It's, it's devastating to see what uh, armed drones really mean. Um, so thank you for your resistance and uh, for encouraging us not to look away. And uh, we'll hear more from you in the q and I look forward to that. Um, so the final speaker of the evening is Maya Garfinkel from World Beyond War. Uh, who will be telling us a bit about how to get involved with the new campaign and, and what's going on. So Maya is the Interim Canada Organizer with World Beyond War, a global nonviolent movement to end war and establish a just and sustainable peace. As an undergrad, she's organized at the intersection of the climate and peace movements with Divest McGill, Students for Peace and Disarmament at McGill, and the Divest for Human Rights campaign. They have also worked on mobilizations around decolonization, anti-racism, and democratization across North America. Welcome, Maya. Thank you so much, Bianca, and thank you so much to all of the speakers today. I am truly honored to be speaking with you all and learning so much from you, uh, even throughout this webinar. I'm here to uh, provide some insights moving forward about the campaign, and I will do my best to keep it brief. I know this has been a lot of intense information to take in, and I do want to give folks an opportunity to sort of get involved and, and see where things are at with all the information that we've uh, learned and talked about today. Um, so as you may or may not know, as Bianca mentioned, this webinar marks the first event for the No Armed Drones campaign. And I'm just gonna share my screen. I have a few visual aids to help explain uh, where I'm going here. And while this is the first public event, organizers have been researching and preparing materials behind the scenes. This campaign is open to new organizers and I'll be talking a little bit on how you can get involved if you feel like you may be a good fit. We really are open to, to all who feel passionately about this issue right now. And that's sort of the beauty of being in these initial uh, foundational stages of the campaign. So in the case of the drone procurement that we're discussing today, 
The bidding is underway, but as was mentioned by Tim, the contract is not yet signed. So consequently, it's extremely important for us to be taking action during this point of limbo before the deal becomes more concretized and the, and the contract is signed. We want to stop it before it is signed, obviously, and Just Peace Advocates has been already taking action on the drone procurement. So in 2021, Just Peace Advocates organized three letter writing initiatives, one before the federal election, one after, and one recently. In total, over 6,000 actions were taken. Over 50 organizations have already signed and endorsed the anti-drone campaign with Justice Advocates, including many Canadian and some international signers. This is the first effort here today uh, that we know of to act against this drone procurement project from multiple angles as a united front, which is really, I think, the key aspect that we're trying to, that we're trying to move forward here. Even just in this webinar, we represent the interests of war abolition, solidarity with populations highly impacted by armed drones, including Palestinians and Afghans, national civil liberty defense, and activists focus on violence within borders, at borders, and more. There has already been research done on drone procurement, as uh, was mentioned earlier, including uh, by Matt Corda of the Federation of American Scientists, uh, Brent Patterson of Peace Brigades International Canada, and from Branka Marijan of Project Plowshares. And you can see here on the screen is an example of some of the public writings that have already been done on this issue. However, as I believe was mentioned in the chat, it is clear that there is a huge uh, lack of national conversation about this issue. And I would, like to, I would like to mention that we believe that this isn't unintentional. It's not uncommon for the Canadian government and states in general to try to push these sort of deals under the noses of the public. So a big part of this campaign in the coming months is going to be looking for individuals and groups to write letters, op-eds, letters to the editor, and making sure that the public is more aware of this issue. Of course, that's just a founding uh, aspect, but of course, if we want to move forward in the campaign, we need to bring public awareness. And this really is a critical piece of the puzzle that needs to bring up the profile of this issue. We actually saw that sort of, uh, that sort of uh, type of campaign effort and bringing public awareness happen um, in Germany in the last decade in their fight against armed drone procurement there. And I'm just gonna move to some slides here that, that show some information about that. We can really learn from this case study to see how uh, activists and, and, and um, campaigners in Germany were able to stall drone procurement for actually about a decade. Um, and this really the key takeaway for me is the fact that this issue was, uh, was fought from multiple angles. They had folks protesting in the streets, they had folks writing letters, op-eds, and there was also uh, work to be done from the inside of the government, um, bringing in the, the Social Democrat Party in Germany to work against armed drone procurement. So here we really want to emulate uh, the energy of the German activists that worked against this and, and capture the public's attention so that we can also move forward uh, installing and then of course canceling this armed drone procurement for the many reasons that we discussed today. So as we move forward, we've seen that there is an open letter that was launched today that we need to move forward on. And I linked, um, it has been linked in the chat and is also linked on the screen. I also want to mention that although there is not very much public conversation right now, we really do believe that we are in a critical period in which Ottawa is not clear which side this drone procurement uh, effort is going to go. The NDP and Green Party have spoken out against uh, drone procurements of this sort, and we really want to move uh, to pressure more and more politicians on the inside uh, to oppose this type of procurement. So this letter campaign is a key part of that. In addition, we're going to be continuing to, to take on research. Um, there is going to be ongoing research in terms of legal inquiries, especially the types that Aziza mentioned, into the illegality of the scenarios mentioned in the, in the procurement document, and legal questions and concerns about the, about the purchase in general. Furthermore, we're going to be trying to make connections with folks on the ground in the locations that we know there are likely to be drone bases. Tim mentioned that there are likely to be drone bases um, in Nova Scotia, Vancouver Island, and likely an operating base in Yellowknife as well. So as I've continued to mention, we know that this campaign will require 
multiple strategies on multiple levels with multiple people of different types of skills. So we really are, uh, really are inviting folks from all walks of life to join us. I think it's easy to find a personal connection to this issue. And once you are able to think of a personal connection to this issue, you can move forward and we can find a personal way that you can make a difference here with us. Like I said before, this is just the start of this campaign and we're really encouraging folks to jump on board, write a letter and send an email so that we can uh, move forward together and make sure that this drone procurement does not move forward. Thank you very much. I'll turn it over to Bianca to begin the Q&A now. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Thank you for the incredible groundwork that you've done on this campaign. Thanks for all those details that you shared about how people can get involved. Please do get involved. Um, we can make a difference. Um, like Maya said, we do have influence. So let's not let's not allow this to happen uh, under our, our noses. Um, so yes, that does conclude the um, the opening remarks for today. Um, and we do have a bit of time left for the Q&A. So we're going to get right to that. There are the, there are a lot of questions that have been submitted to the Q&A. Thank you so much for those. I'm um, going to get right to Greg's question, which is today we think about how to resist buying armed drones. Other times we're trying to resist fighter jets or such. What can we do to weaken forces that motivate these purchases? I'm thinking about investors who make money at arms. Um, how about if Canada made a rule that private Canadians are not allowed to invest in arms, just like we're not supposed to invest in child porn or something? Um, what do we think about <clears throat> somehow making it illegal for Canadians to profit from arms? So I'm going to turn that over to uh, panelists. Is there anyone who'd like to, to, to take a step, to take a, a shot at that? I'm happy to hop in on one aspect of that. I can't speak to the to the legal aspects. Perhaps uh, Aziza or others can pop in on that. But I did want to mention an important part that you brought up there, which is the fact that people are making money from these types of drone procurements, which is something that Samer brought up so eloquently, that there are companies and arms manufacturers and individuals who are monetizing the type of violence that we're talking today. And I think that an important part of this campaign will be not only the letters and talking to MPs and that sort of thing, but also making sure that we are divesting from the war machine, as has been mentioned in the US, there's an entire organization dedicated to that. But we need to also be focusing on taking money from uh, out of the investments that we put in for these arms manufacturers uh, through the Canadian Pension Fund Plan, which, which funds these types of arms manufacturers through big institutions um, here at McGill University, which is where my background is. McGill is currently in collaboration with Lockheed Martin, uh, one of the biggest arms manufacturers and the likely uh, fighter jet uh, producer that, that you mentioned as well. Um, so we need to be looking at big institutions, big investors um, that are that are actively profiting from this. Um, and in terms of the legal aspects, I'll be turning it over to Aziza and I saw Kathy you unmuted as well. I know you said what I was going to uh, suggest. Thanks, Maya. I don't know. I don't know if law is the terrain on which these types of investments can be fought precisely because Canadian law as a subtler enterprise is founded on military dispossession and domination of Indigenous peoples. In fact, in the letter of interest, the economic benefits is precisely one of the dimensions uh, that is the um, uh, that is the, the the rationale, or that is a a, a dimension of of how different uh, corporations can differentiate themselves. In seeking, in seeking the contract. So questions they have to answer, for instance, are what kind of uh, R&D uh, opportunities uh, for financial gain will there be if we award you the contract? What kinds of jobs will be provided? And so when it's not simply that the economic benefits are, are um, a side a side aspect of this that are being ignored, but rather are foundational to the entire to the entire enterprise. Uh, it seems um, 
it, it seems optimistic to think that it could be made illegal. And in fact, I think time and time again, we see how law far from being the solution to these problems of structural violence are in fact a foundational part of the way that these violences are permitted to perpetuate themselves, which in a way is, is good news for us here because it means you don't have to be a lawyer or a legal expert to have power and influence and effect on, these, on this issue. In fact, what is much more powerful is the combined action of all of us on the ground saying that it doesn't matter if it's legal or illegal, rather it's, Im it's immoral, it is profoundly unethical. And in fact, it is reflective of an entire colonial body of law that has been formulated in order to ratify, authorize, and legitimize the dispossession and domination of the colonized and the dispossessed. And so that is that is what uh, we are we are up against. Um, Maya uh, said uh, earlier that there are so many different points of entry for this. We know from abolitionist uh, discourse, the work of Ruth Wilson Gilmore, approaching this from an abolitionist perspective, that. The goal is to change everything, is to change all of the conditions of possibility that not only, um, it's not only to dismantle the drones or the prisons or police, but it's to dismantle the entire conditions of possibility that give rise to such institutions in the first place. Such a task can seem daunting, but it's also an opportunity and a possibility because if the goal is to change everything, then that means that wherever we are, we can change something that can make a difference. Um, that can make a difference on this. So whether you're a lawyer or a, or a non-lawyer, I think that we all have power to, uh, to exert. Thank you, Aziza. Um, the next question is from Barry, who wants to know, where does the process to open Canada airspace to large military drones stand? Does, does anyone know the answer to that? Sorry, Barry. We don't know. No, I, I, oh. I could jump oh. in. I don't know what the what the, where the process is. I know that in the RFP that they have called for drones that are able to work in congested domestic uh, areas. Um, and so I'm not sure to what degree there would need to be or what the legal process would be to allow them to fly. Um, but you know, I think as we've seen with the RCMP using um, you know surveillance planes already. Um, and uh, I don't think it'll be very complicated for the Canadian government to take, you know, take action to, to allow the military to fly um, their own drones, um, much different than I think is a process for allowing, you know, private drones to be, to be flown. Thanks, ma'am. Um, Yuri would like to know, sort of on a related note, uh, many of us were also part of the No Fighter Jets campaign. Um, Yuri wants to know, does anyone on the panel can anyone answer if the Canadian government has purchased the fighter jets the peace movement in Canada has been trying to resist, or is this still an ongoing fight? Um, Yuri's other question is on the issue of militarism and its links to the climate crisis. Are environmental groups in Canada specifically been doing um, a job? I think that means maybe a good job at making the case that one can't be an environmentalist and support any kind of militarism, whether it's fighter jets, drones, or NATO uh, and pivot to Asia, or still a long way to go on that issue. So yeah, so two questions from Yuri. Basically, where where are things at? Did, did Canada did Canada buy those fighter jets? And uh, how's how's the climate uh, movement doing with respect to militarism? So um, yeah, I'll just open it up to our panelists to take uh, one or our, either of those questions. Can I jump in just on the second? Yeah, of course. Um, I really can't on the first. But I mean, I think this is a really important point. And in having discussions with uh, people on both sides, a kind of anti-war, but also climate movement, there really is a disconnect between the two, but a growing recognition that um, uh, military em em emissions in of itself, which um, is where there isn't a kind of mandatory reporting is an important area for growth. What we're seeing a, a lot of that interest right now in that space, unfortunately, is just being politicized and used to target Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, so it's a lot of discussion about the, the climate impacts of the Russia's invasion of Ukraine. However, um, th this is really an important area. And I think we will never, I think that there's a huge opportunity for continuing to bridge the anti-war movement and the climate movement. We probably, uh, with military reporting, we could probably estimate, or some some people who write 
estimate that the single the single largest contributor to um, to carbon emissions globally in aggregate is, aggregate is probably the Pentagon, the U.S. military in aggregate. That is just in the you know uh, the the maintenance of bases globally, but also in waging wars. This doesn't include the actual climate uh, devastation of uh, the bombs and, and chemical weapons. Um, but so I, I do think this is a huge leverage point um, and something that we need to work um, work a little bit more on. And, and I, will, uh, I, I would assume that we're going to hear a lot more on this topic in the coming years. I, I do not think we'll be able to, as, uh, as, a, as a global community, actually address the climate crisis without a, a, um, a huge anti-war movement and, uh, and vice versa. Uh, would anyone else care to comment on the, um, the environmental aspect of, uh, of Yuri's question, the climate crisis and militarism and the movements? Uh, does someone else want to go first? Go ahead, Aziza. Okay. I, I want to uh, echo Summer's exhortation about the imperative of connecting climate justice and anti-war movements. We know part of the cunning of state violence is its ability to co-opt any issue, any cause in order to aggrandize its own power, including the imperative of addressing climate um, catastrophe. For example, in the letter of interest for the drone purchase, the scenario involving Arctic surveillance is actually done in the name of, or justified in the name of uh, protecting a climate justice convoy that is uh, sailing in the Arctic. And so under the umbrella of protecting climate justice activists, we see the justification for purchase of a drone. And this green militarism is something that's coming up again and again and again in rationalizations for the importance of the military as a primary actor, not as a source of, of, of climate damage and of and ecological damage, but actually as the solution is representing itself as a solution to climate damage. I remember reading, for example, about military R&D uh, where they're developing bullets that when they're fired, uh, they will uh, they contain seeds. So after after enacting their lethal violence, they spring into flowers on the ground, regreening the very communities which they have devastated with their military violence. In order to contest this kind of uh, of militaristic co-optation of ecological justice, we in environmental movements have to be prioritizing and centering the voices and the perspectives of those who have been most affected and have suffered the greatest brunt of military violence for centuries, indigenous peoples who are at the forefront of protecting territories and, and, and ecologies, uh, racialized people who are for too long have been marginalized in environmental movements, such that environmental movements themselves sometimes has been, have been using the language of war to describe what needs to be done to fight climate change. We talk about a war against climate change. No, we don't need a war against climate change. We need in fact, the exact opposite of war against, against climate change. And one that is premised on upholding the knowledge and the practices and the voices of those who have suffered the greatest violences of war all along. Maya, go ahead. I just wanted to add one more point after uh, Summer and Aziza's uh, really important points as well from a more mobilization perspective. I think uh, there's a lot to be said about climate justice organizers uh, connecting the dots to, to militarism. And I also think that there is a lot to be said about folks within the, the, the peace movement going into climate justice world as well. I think that needs to be a reciprocal relationship. And I think that we could be doing better in terms of not only paying lip service to environmental and climate justice issues, but also actually joining those movements and mobilizing um, alongside of, of climate justice organizers. I also want to mention that in my experience working with other Gen Z organizers, that there is a lot of support for peace work and anti-militarism. And anti um, I also want to mention that a lot of the time, I think an issue with this in, within climate justice movements is simply a lack of vocabulary uh, for talking about militarism. Oftentimes I've found that 
Um, I'll start talking about militarism and the folks around me organizing in Gen Z climate justice spaces will nod along and start. And then the next few days, I'll see that sort of information and, and vocabulary start to be disseminated outwards. So I think that there are a lot of folks, especially in younger generations of climate justice movements, who really understand the importance of intersectionality in climate justice and are beginning to and are beginning to connect the dots with uh, not only intersectionality in terms of race and class and gender, but also intersectionality in terms of imperialism, colonialism, and all the sort of institutions that that militarism upholds. So I hope that that is a hopeful note um, and also um, just a point about mobilization in general that we can continue to push ourselves within the, the peace movement to, to enter climate justice spaces and not only the other way around. Thank you, Maya. And um, Yuri, uh, your question um, about the, the fighter jets, uh, Canada did recently uh, choose um, Lockheed Martin's uh, F-35. Um, as their their pick for this the 19 billion dollar um, purchase, um, actually 77 billion dollars. Um, but you know the deal's not signed yet. Um, so uh, you know folks are still pushing back. and um, I do uh, encourage people to find out more about the no fighter jets dot, uh, campaign at nofighterjets.ca. I don't know if there's is there anything you'd like to add about the fighter jets uh, campaign, Maya? I think you mentioned it. Um, I think that the Fighter Jets website is an excellent resource for folks uh, getting started in that. And I would like to put on people's radar that we are expecting to revitalize efforts within that campaign over the next few months as capacity is increasing. There's been some new staff members hired and a few organizations involved. So please do keep your eye out uh, on the No Fighter Jets campaign in the, in the months to come. I also would like to mention that uh, although the no armed uh, drones campaign and the no fighter jets campaign obviously do have parallels in terms of uh, their impact and the way that the Canadian government is handling them. I also think this webinar and other resources like it are going to be super important to talk about the, the different impacts, specifically as we've talked about today, how armed drones impact uh, so-called domestic populations in a different way than fighter jets have. And I think that that's gonna be really important moving forward. Uh, as well. But thank you for, for bringing that up again, Bianca. Um, so the next question I have is um, specifically for Summers. Um, uh, someone would like to know, can you speak uh, more about the Pegasus spyware and the designation of the six Palestinian human rights groups? Are there examples of Pegasus spyware being used in Canada? Okay, yeah, well, um... Thanks for asking that. Um, yeah, Pegasus spyware has been used in Canada. One of Jamal Khashoggi's uh, close contacts, who I mentioned, was surveilled uh, using Pegasus. And um, so certainly it has been. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think the, the, the stand with the six campaign and the, the silencing and of Palestinian uh, civil society organizations is something I think that... Um, we're probably not going to have time to, to unpack, but certainly there's a clamping down of Palestinian civil society and essentially uh, calling them uh, terrorists and suggesting they're, they're undertaking terrorist activities, um, of course, without uh, any evidence. These are organizations that are raising um, and um, raising uh, important uh, awareness about Palestinian human rights and have been doing so for decades the one thing um and so the the essay like you know the pieces of the essay that uh that i had read um it it starts out speaking about pegasus and i close with uh project nimbus which it talks about google and amazon's engagement with a 1.2 billion dollar contract to provide cloud computing and ai services to the israeli military and other state agencies and like the the point really is an in to look at the way corporations more broadly, um, corporations that are not traditionally involved in weapons development, more broadly get enrolled in producing uh, weapons and surveilling um, certain populations. And, and so, you know, Pegasus, Project Nimbus, drones, these things in, in some sense, I think are case studies or microcosms for us to understand the way violence is enacted and monetized. 
And so, uh, and that ties in a little bit to the earlier question, I think, around corporations and what can we do um, about it. Um, I I know we're 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 just about to close, and if I may, I did. It it also ties into the question by Makayla about uh, drones in the Israeli market because I think that's also important. The the point that I was trying uh, to make uh, it into focusing on Israel's military industrial ecosystem and the link between apartheid and the development of drones, for instance, is not just to single out Israel. There are other countries that produce drones. The US, Turkey is emerging as a big drones player. And the, the conceptually, the idea is to really understand that this purchase of, the you know, purchasing drones is not just about purchasing a technology. These technologies, even if they're branded as uh, parks and recreation technologies or environmental technologies, which is what happened with drones post-apartheid South Africa, they were widely rebranded as something used for parks and recreations and, so, and safaris and things like that. But that the point is in that any of these technologies are developed and advanced through the enactment of violence. And, and to understand the consequences and implications of Canada or any other country to actually purchase these weapons is to understand what that purchase entails in, in terms of what went into the development of these technologies and the populations that are that were subjugated through their development. And that will help us understand the consequences of what will happen through their use and deployment, um, be it in Canada or other places. So thanks for that question. I hope that answers that question as well. Thank you, Summer. Uh, just a very quick technical question. Um, Kimri wants to know, who is the manufacturer of the drones that the government intends um, to purchase? Does anyone uh, know the answer to that? Uh, Tim or Maya, would either of you have that information? Yeah, for sure. So the, the information that we have is that the two bidders um, that the Canadian government has identified are L3 Technologies working with Israel Aerospace Industries. And they're pitching a modified version of its of the Heron drone, um, which is a favorite of the of the Israeli Defense Forces. Um, and General Atomics is uh, proposing Canada by the MQ-9B Sky Guardian, um, and they're also working with the uh, the United States um, administration for that um, for that bid. So those are the two main competitors right now, as far as we know. Um, they were identified, I think, back in 2019 as being the two candidates, and then they've both, we would imagine, received a new um, uh, request for proposals that will formalize their, their bids, and then the government will decide between the two of them. It's possible that's been expanded and we don't know, but that's the, the information that we have. And the latest articles um, on it have talked about two bidders not identifying the two um, from back in January 2022 so if it is still two bidders um, it would be you know I think we can assume that, it, that it's still those two um, yeah thank you thank you Tim um, so we have uh, pretty much run out of time um, we got to the Q&A a bit late so I'm just going to take uh, I think just one or two last questions before we close out um, maybe briefly, if anyone knows the answer to this, um, I got received this question in advance. Where did the Canadian political parties stand in regard to this contract and drones being used um, for surveillance as well as being armed? Um, does anyone have any insight um, into the Canadian political parties and their positions on this? Um, I'm happy to hop in just with some very, you know, fundamental positions that I know we've gathered from, from our research thus far. Um, thus far, uh, uh, Jagmeet Singh of the NDP has said that he's against the purchase of armed drones in 2021. However, he hasn't talked about it lately beyond that. Um, the liberal position as of now, as far as we know, is continuing to push for the purchase of armed drones, which of course, to, to all you uh, who are in the country is not too surprising to you, most likely. And then, of course, Conservative Party of Canada uh, has said nothing so far, but is also likely supported. The Green Party has not said anything that we know of, particularly about this drone procurement project. However, they have historically been against autonomous weapons and in favor of reducing military spending, but have remained vague uh, most of the time. 
Um, additionally, some of the smaller parties, including the Bloc Québécois, um, have denounced federal government for lack of transparency about the program, um, but seem to be more concerned about sort of the economic side of the issue. Um, and then finally, the Communist Party of Canada is against the armed drone purchase. Um, so we do believe that there is leverage, especially with the NDP and Green Party. Um, and I think it's also worth uh, going to some of those other parties as well, especially speaking to MPs who we might already have connections with in the peace movement. Um, so just a little bit of a summary so far, the only uh, parties that we have who've spoken on this issue in particular are the Green Party and the NDP. I hope that answers your question uh, briefly. And I can send some links about that in the chat as well. Thank you. Um, okay, so the last question that I'm going to take is uh, kind of an action oriented question. So um, feel free to talk about any actions you think we should be taking. Uh, Laurel wants to know, what do you think about starting a campaign to get people who do war work to stop doing it? Arms trade, arms forces, military research, point out the damage that's being done, show them how, how their participation is key to its discontinuation. Um, make them listen to vic the victims of war, talk about the madness of nuclear weapons and armed drones, educate people into the idea of refusing to do it anymore. What do people think of that as a campaign idea? Can I, I, I think it's a brilliant idea. Um, you know, I think about the parallel when we talk about a just transition, we think about moving people that are working in the fossil fuel industry and what that would take uh, in terms of um, moving people or creating opportunities in in renewables, for instance, and I think absolutely, um, you know, people working in, in military companies, I, I think often uh, don't know or or don't necessarily want to know. I mean, people often work out of uh, necessity or lack of other um, opportunities. But uh, if there's some way of um, encouraging people to, um, or encouraging people to stand up within companies and and shift the type of work that they do uh, for other industries. I think one of the biggest things that's starting to happen, and we're seeing a resurgence of uh, labor organizing across um, at least North America. I think it's the highest in the last forty years. Um, labor organizing. There's a lot of discussion discussion around democratization in the workplace and even in uh, business schools a lot of more and more faculty are really thinking and talking about what um, democracy in workplaces looks like and and these types of uh, moves and momentums may create opportunities for people to stand up and say like workers in Amazon and Google right now are standing up saying we don't want our companies to be participating in crimes against humanity so there may be opportunities um, there for things like that I think it's a it's a long game but certainly, I think there are parallels where we can think about, um, you know, how that might happen. So it was a great point to be raised. Thank you. Um, would anyone else like to chime in on the activism piece before uh, we conclude our session for today? I'll just jump in very brief. Oh, go ahead, Kelly. I've mentioned right. a lot. Kathy and then Maya. So I was just going to say that you know, one talking point is that we can't begin to address the very real terrors we face, the terrors of climate catastrophe, pandemics, and of course, nuclear weapons, unless we learn collectively to dismantle our terrible military systems and budgets. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Maya. Thank you, Kathy. I just wanted to mention quite quickly um, that there has been some efforts in terms of targeting uh, folks who do military research, um, including uh, researchers, again, I'm using McGill University as an example, as one of the biggest uh, research institutions in the country. Uh, uh, researchers who work with military uh, manufacturers have been targeted by name before. And although I think that has some promise and should definitely be pursued if folks are interested in that, I think a lot of the progress that needs to be made here is going to be reaching out to our allies, especially initially, uh, to get folks even just in the loop that this is happening. And additionally, uh, reaching out to young people who are entering the job market for the first time. And like was mentioned, uh, speaking to labor unions um, and those who are already uh, who are already working as a group. I know World Beyond War just awarded uh, one of our war abolition abolisher awards 
to an Italian union um, who were working to stop the shipment of, of war materials across the world. So that's just an incredible example to me of, of an example of unions being able to, to really be allies um, in, this, in this type of scenario. Wonderful. I think uh, that is a beautiful note for us to conclude today's presentations and Q&A. Um, thank you to everybody at home. Um, thank you to our panelists for an incredible discussion. It was so lively, so detailed. I know that I learned a lot. I know that our audience did too. I'm seeing lots of comments. Um, thank you for your tremendous analysis uh, and for your amazing work. It's been a great event. Let's try and translate um, some of this into action. Thanks again to our panelists, uh, Maya, Kathy, Samar, Tim, uh, and Aziza. Please do find out more about the uh, amazing work of all of these panelists and the host organizations, um, the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, Just Peace Advocates, and World Beyond War Canada. Um, thanks again to our audience for joining us and for your excellent questions. Um, that's it for our event. Goodbye and peace. Thank you very much. Thank you.